In the past we looked at how photons are emitted and how this creates an emission and an absorption spectrum. In this part we will examine how light, or more specifically electromagnetic radiation, can interact with matter and what fingerprints these interactions leave behind. Collisional or pressure broadening In the last part we discussed the emission and absorption spectra and showed how discrete lines are created. These all assume a largely stationary gas particle, with no other particles to interact with. When you examine the emission spectra of low pressure gases, you see very characteristic line emissions, but as the pressure and temperature increase, the spectrum changes to a more continuous one. Perturbations by colliding atoms in a high pressure gas result in broadening of the emission and absorption lines. The broadening in frequency width is dependent upon the separation of the perturbing particles. The finite duration of the emission of a photon by the transition of an electron leads to a finite width line. For high pressure gas, radiating times can be much greater compared to the time between collisions. The collisions cause premature transitions and emission of a photon. The decreased lifetime of the state creates an increased uncertainty in the photon energy, broadening the emission line. As the temperature of the gas increases, the rate of collisions increases as well, and the broadening becomes more pronounced. In a low pressure gas, the particles can be considered as isolated, which leads to discrete line emissions. As the pressure increases, the system can no longer be considered as isolated. Instead, the presence of surrounding atoms causes perturbations, meaning there is no longer a fixed separation between any two energy levels. This also applies to the process of absorption lines. This means that the spectra will become more and more continuous as the lines are broadened. Photoelectric effect The photoelectric effect is the emission of electrons when electromagnetic radiation, like light, hits the material. The electrons emitted in this manner are called photoelectrons. The experimental results disagree with classical electromagnetism, which predicts that continuous light waves transfer energy to the electrons, which would then be emitted when they accumulate enough energy. If there was a subsequent change in the intensity of the light, there should theoretically be a change in the kinetic energy of the emitted electrons. If the light source was sufficiently dim, it should cause a delay in emission. Experiments show that electrons are dislodged only when the light exceeds a certain frequency, regardless of the light's intensity or duration of exposure. This demonstrates that light could not be treated as a simple wave, but instead a swarm of discrete packets known as photons. Emission of conduction electrons from typical metals requires a few electron volts, which requires blue-violet light and ultraviolet light and higher. Thomson scattering. Thomson scattering is the elastic scattering of electromagnetic radiation by a free charged particle. The particle's kinetic energy and the photon frequency do not change as a result of the scattering. This works as long as the photon energy is much smaller than the mass energy of the particle. As long as the motion of the particle is non-relativistic, the main cause of the acceleration of the particle will be due to the electric field component of the incident photon wave. The particle will move in the direction of the oscillating electric field, resulting in electromagnetic dipole radiation. The moving particle radiates most strongly in a direction perpendicular to its acceleration, and that radiation will be polarised along the direction of its motion. For an electron, this limit is hard X-rays. Above this, Compton scattering will take place. Compton scattering Compton scattering is an example of an inelastic scattering of light by a free charged particle, where the wavelength of the scattered light is different from that of the incident radiation. It is the mechanism of scattering high frequency photons after an interaction with stationary charged particles, usually an electron. This results in a decrease in energy of the photon and as a result its wavelength will increase. Part of the energy of the photon is transferred to the recoiling electron. If a photon interacts with a moving charged particle, the particle can transfer its kinetic energy to the photon, increasing the photon's energy, thereby decreasing its wavelength. This is called inverse Compton scattering. 
In both cases, the photon is absorbed and then re-emitted in a different direction in order to conserve the momentum. Double and multiple Compton scattering. This is an important process in high temperature photon dominated plasmas. A seed photon is required and occurs when an incident photon scattered on an electron results in two or more outgoing photons. Raman scattering. Raman scattering is an inelastic scattering of photons by matter. Typically, this effect involves vibrational energy being gained by a molecule as incident photons from a visible laser are shifted to lower energy. Rayleigh scattering. Rayleigh scattering is predominantly an elastic scattering of electromagnetic radiation by particles much smaller than the wavelength of the radiation. It results from the electric polarizability of the particles. The oscillating electric field of a light wave acts on the charges within a particle, causing them to move at the same frequency. The particle therefore becomes a small radiating dipole whose radiation we see as scattered light. This effect is the reason for the blue colour of the daytime sky, as well as the yellowish to reddish hue of the low sun. Sunlight is also subject to Raman scattering, which changes the rotational state of the molecules and gives rise to a polarization effect. Me scattering is an elastic scattering of light by a dielectric sphere. In principle, this could be larger or around the same size as the wavelength of the light. Me scattering is much stronger than Rayleigh scattering and therefore a potential source of interference. It can also produce resonances in the scattered light. The grey and white colour of clouds is caused by me scattering by water droplets which are of comparable size to the wavelength of visible light. Now in principle we can therefore say that where the state of the electron before and after the absorption and re-emission of the photon is unchanged, the incoming photon frequency is the same as the re-emitted one. When this is not the case and the electron is scattered, then we can see that the electron moves relative to the observer and therefore we get a Doppler shift and subsequent change in the frequency relative to the observer. Refraction In all the cases we have discussed so far, the photon is absorbed by an atom or molecule and then re-emitted. So how does refraction work then? What causes the photon to slow down inside an optical medium? There are a number of different ways of looking at this problem, and I will only cover the classical electrodynamical approach. Here we will consider light as an electromagnetic wave, as described by Maxwell's equations. In the vacuum of space they are free to travel, but when they travel through a more dense material we need to consider the effect that the oscillating electric field of the light wave has on the atoms and electrons that make up the material. The electrons will start to oscillate in sympathy and cause each particle to radiate a small secondary wave in all directions, like a dipole antenna. These waves will interfere with a photon wave and the resulting wave will travel slower. The important difference is that the photon does not cause the electrons in the atoms to jump to an excited state. It merely causes an oscillation of the current state. This is why the photons can pass through a medium like glass in a straight line and will only be bent at the boundary between two different types of media due to the change in speed of the waves. Reflection Reflection is similar to refraction in that it is once more the incoming EM wave which causes oscillations in the electrons of the material and the photon is not absorbed by the reflecting material. In a metal, the waves are radiated by the oscillating free electrons. This creates an oscillating current in the surface of the metal. This creates an oscillating electric field which is 180 degrees out of phase with the incoming wave. The free electrons in a metal have a natural frequency of oscillation called the plasma frequency. Metals will reflect EM waves below their plasma frequency. If we take sodium as an example, this has a plasma frequency that corresponds to a wavelength of 210 nanometers. When the incoming EM wave has a frequency above the plasma frequency, the electrons in the material will not be able to respond quickly enough and the wave will pass through. In the case of sodium, this would be anything above ultraviolet. Pair production. Pair production is the creation of a subatomic particle and its antiparticle from a neutral boson. It often specifically refers to a photon creating an electron-positron pair 
near a nucleus. As the energy must be conserved, the incoming energy of the photon must be above the threshold of at least the total rest mass energy of the two particles created. This is the opposite process of beta plus decay. Photo disintegration. Sometimes it is also called phototransmutation or photonuclear reactions. And it is a nuclear process where an atomic nucleus absorbs a high energy gamma ray. This causes it to enter an excited state and immediately release this energy by emitting part of the particles within the nucleus. This could be a neutron, proton or alpha particle. In some sense, this is the opposite of the emission of gamma rays in some nuclear reactions. And this is a topic we will return to in connection with a structured atomic model. Photofission. This is the process in which a nucleus absorbs a gamma ray and then undergoes nuclear fission splitting into two or more fragments. Gamma radiation of around the low tens of mega electron volts can induce fission in traditionally fissile elements such as thorium, uranium and plutonium. Dispersion measure. This only applies to radio waves due to the low energy of the photons. In the presence of charged particles, the electrostatic interaction between the light and the charged particles causes a delay in the propagation of the light. More energetic and hence higher frequency photons are less affected than lower frequency. This causes the delay to increase with lower frequencies. Generally, this effect is more significant for electrons compared to protons, meaning the dispersion measure is a way to gauge the number of free electrons in the intervening space. Whistler mode. A whistler is a very low frequency electromagnetic wave generated by a discharge like a lightning strike. In the case of a lightning strike, the wave travels along the Earth's magnetic field lines from one hemisphere to the other. During this journey, it will undergo dispersion due to the plasma in the ionosphere and magnetosphere, meaning that the frequency would be perceived as a descending tone which can last for a few seconds. Cherenkov radiation. Cherenkov radiation is electromagnetic radiation when a charged particle passes through a dielectric medium at a speed greater than the phase velocity of the light in that medium. This results in the blue radiation seen in an underwater nuclear reactor. In some sense, it is similar to a sonic boom. In water, light will travel at around three quarters its speed in a vacuum. Nuclear reactions can cause particles to be emitted and accelerated to speeds that are higher than this but slower than the speed of light in a vacuum. When a charged particle passes through a medium, the particles in the medium will polarize around it in response. The charged particle excites the molecules in the polarizable medium and on return to their ground state, the molecules re-emit the energy given to them to achieve excitation as photons. The polarization field is asymmetric along the direction of the motion of the particle as the particles of the medium do not have enough time to recover their normal state. This results in overlapping wavefronts and constructive interference leading to an observed cone-like light signal at a characteristic angle. And that brings us to the end of this episode. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you did, please consider leaving a like and subscribing if you haven't already. As always, be brave, be curious. The truth is waiting for us. Until next time. <laughs>